Good morning. I'd like for you to open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 20. The title of the lesson is, Why Felix? Why? We want to ask the question, why did Felix, with every opportunity to obey the gospel, why did he not give his life to Christ? In order for us to move forward, I want us to, to provide a background, and so I want for us to start in Acts chapter 20, and I want us to look at the chapters that come before to lay the foundation for us to have an understanding of all the events that led up to the point in which the Apostle Paul then was faced with Felix. In Acts chapter 20, we find that even going back to, to chapter 19, that the Apostle Paul had left Corinth and he was in Ephesus, and so there was an interaction with the people of Ephesus, and he was trying to teach them to follow the one true living God instead of bowing down and worshiping idols, false gods like Diana. And so eventually he left there and then began journeying again in Acts chapter 20. He came to Troas and there in verse 7 of Acts 20 he worshiped with the saints and he preached the gospel and we continue to, to read on down and he continued his journeys. In Acts chapter 20 and verse 16 he determined to go by Ephesus but rather then he called from Miletus and he sent in verse 17 to Ephesus and he called the elders of the church together. And so he was passing through on his third missionary journey and he wanted to meet with the elders of Ephesus to deliver them a message. And, and as he sits with them and, he, and he, he reminds them that with many tears all the things that he had testified to them and how he had not held back any of the gospel but had preached the whole counsel of God unto them, he tells them to be ready and to be on guard, verse 28, because he knows in verse 29 and following that there will be those that will arise to draw disciples away. And so he commends them in verse 32 to the word, to God and to the word of his grace. And then we continue to read on down and we find this, this relationship and, and how significant and important the relationship was between the elders that were there at Ephesus and the Apostle Paul. And so as he tells them, I'm not going to see you anymore. This is it. This is my final goodbye. You won't be able to see me face to face anymore. And they wept and they embraced and then he continued to travel. And so he boards a ship and he continues to go and then eventually comes over to Caesarea Maritime in verse 8. And as he entered there, he finds Philip and he continues there in this area. Now there's, there's two different Caesareas and sometimes we might get them confused. This is the Caesarea that is just not very far from Tyre and Sidon. It's on the coast, over right there on the shores. And so this is where he has landed, and as he does so, it's very interesting that this one particular prophet, Agabus, in verse 10 of Acts chapter 21, approaches Paul with a, with a prophecy. He tells him that this is going to happen to you. He comes to him and and he took Paul's girdle and he bound his own hands and feet and said, Thus saith the Holy Ghost, So shall the Jews at Jerusalem bind the man that owneth this girdle and shall deliver him into the hands of the Gentiles. Paul knew what was going to happen. There was a prophet that came to him and told him, This is what's going to take place. And yet Paul still pressed forward to go into this place. He heard these things. And they, they tried to beg him not to go. Don't go to Jerusalem, verse 12. Uh, but ultimately, they realized that he was going to go. And so they knew that the, the, the will of the Lord would be done, according to verse 14. And so he prepared then to go down into Jerusalem. And so we see that he enters into Jerusalem and there's an interaction with some of the brethren there. 
And I'm skipping over a little bit, but I'm going to jump down to verse 27. We find that there was a vow that, that Paul joined in. Some would say this was the Nazarite vow. And so he joined into this vow, and there were those that saw him in the temple. And there were Jews that were of Asia. These were not their, the local individuals. These were from another town, from another region, but they were there, and they saw Paul, and they saw him in the temple. And in verse 27, they stirred the people up, and they laid hands on him. And then they began to lay charges against the Apostle Paul that everywhere he went, he was teaching people against the law, against Moses. And the accusation they bring against him in verse 28 is that he brought Greeks into the temple and that he polluted the holy place of God. In verse 29, we find that it, it, it wasn't true, but this was an accusation they brought against him. They assumed, they supposed that Paul brought in Trophimus of Ephesus, this Ephesian, with him into the temple because at some point they saw Paul talking with Trophimus. And so they made a, a wild assumption that he had taken him then into the temple and then had defiled the temple. So they laid this accusation before the people and then the Bible says that all the city was moved. The people ran against him and they took a hold of Paul. They drew him out of the temple, shut the door so that he couldn't get back in, in essence. And then what did they do? Verse 31. They went about to kill him. And you can imagine how volatile this situation was as now Paul is there and he's in Jerusalem and he already knows that there's trouble that was awaiting him that through the Holy Spirit a prophet told him these things and yet he's there and all of this begins to take place. They went about to kill him. But then there was news that came to the chief captain of the band that was in uh, Jerusalem and that's the tribune. And then they told him, look, this is what's happening. All Jerusalem is in uproar. You need to get down here and you need to take care of this. And so he took his soldiers and his centurions and he ran down. And really, it wasn't that much of a distance from where he was staying, according to history and historians. It wasn't far from where he was at, this captain, this chief captain, and where the uproar took place there by the temple. And so it didn't take long for him to get down there and to try to take care of the situation. And so they stopped beating on Paul. So already Paul's getting a good beating. They intend to kill him, so they weren't just kind of smacking him around. It was hurting. And they, they laid upon him for the purpose of taking his life, but before they had an opportunity to do so, the soldiers came in and stopped it. The chief captain came, verse 33, near, took him, commanded him to be bound with two chains, and then they didn't, he didn't even know who he was. So who is this guy? And tell me, what has he done? Why are you trying to beat him and hurt him? Let me know this information. In verse 34, they began to cry out. And again, there was this tumult. And so finally, the captain said, take him into the castle. Take him away. And so they, they took him because of the violence of the people. Verse 35. And the multitude followed along, crying away with him. They wanted Paul dead. Now, where did this come from? It all started with some Jews that were from out of town. And these religious individuals said they want to see this man dead. And so ultimately, it led to the Romans intervening. And as Paul was led into the castle, he spoke with the captain. He asked if the captain would allow him the opportunity to stand before the people that had accused him and that actually were beating on him and to speak to this group of people. And so the captain allowed it. And so he began to speak in verse 40. That is Paul. Paul stood before this great mob, this tumult that was out to kill him and had beaten on him. And he began to speak in the, the, the local tongue, the native tongue. He spoke in Hebrew. And when he did this, the people began to really listen. They quietened down big time because he wasn't just speaking in Greek or something else. He was speaking their language. Not everybody could do that. So they listened very carefully. 
And he began to make his defense. He began to explain in chapter 22 all his, in essence, conversion story. How he came from being a Pharisee and a Jew to being a New Testament Christian. And that, that on that road to Damascus, what happened to him? And he explained all of that and that he had been chosen to take the gospel by Jesus Christ to the Gentile people. And then you read in verse 16, he was baptized, having his sins washed away, calling on the name of the Lord. And then we keep on reading as he's trying to explain all of this, that the people didn't like what he was saying. In verse 22, they gave him audience, but then they began to get frustrated. They lifted up their voice and said, away with this fellow from the earth, for it is not fit that he should live. He needs to die. They said about Paul. They cried out. They cast off their clothes. They threw dust into the air. The Jews, they're upset. They're angry. And so we come down to verse 24. And the chief captain commanded that Paul be brought back into the, into the castle. And because of everything that has taken place, the Jews refuse to hear anything really that he has to say. He still had an opportunity. He still preached the gospel to them. And then they are upset. So they bring him in and they say, look, scourge him. He's called all this problem for me. The Romans said scourge him. And so as you read, and that is found in verse 24 of Acts chapter 22, then in verse 25, it's interesting that they had already bound him and he's there and he's about to get this scourging and he asks, now is this, is this, is this lawful? In verse 25, is this lawful for you to scourge a man that's a Roman and has not even been condemned? And boy, they heard that and they were scared. You know why? Because of Caesar. As a Roman, you break the law. In the Roman system, it was not good. You had to answer to Caesar. And so they were, and because he says he's a Roman, then they are all frustrated. And that the centurion heard this. He ran and said, hey, I got to go tell the captain. He says, captain, guess what? This guy, he says he's a Roman citizen. And so he comes in. The captain says, oh, is this true? Is you, are you a Roman citizen? And Paul says, yes, I am. Verse 27. So the chief captain answered and he said, well, look, I, I got my citizenship as a Roman. I purchased it. It took me a lot of money to buy my citizenship. But Paul, he says, I have a greater citizenship. There were levels, four classes of Roman citizens. And one guy says, I bought this with a sum of money. That's way down here. But Paul was born into this thing. And because he was born in, by a Roman family as a Roman citizen, he had the highest class of protection of a Roman. And when Paul said that, he, the, the, the chief captain was, was fearing. So he loosed him of his bands. He commanded the chief priest, the council, that is the Jews, to come down and they set Paul before him and the council came together and he begins again to speak to them. And you've got the high priest Ananias that is there. And then Paul has an interchange going back and forth with Ananias. And ultimately, Paul perceives that out in the audience, there's some Sadducees and there's some Pharisees. And let me tell you, Paul wasn't born yesterday. Now he's on trial again. And he sees, oh, there's a divided group that's out there that's trying to get after me. And all I have to do is say, hey, I believe in the resurrection. And that's why these people are upset. And then all of a sudden, the Sadducees start fighting against the Pharisees. And they're not after Paul anymore. They're after each other. He was pretty clever, I got to say. In the middle of this, he then did this. And then look in verse 7. In this chapter, and it says that the multitude was divided. There was a dissension among the people. And so they were going back and forth and there was great problems there. But it says that there arose a great dissension. The chief captain in verse 10, fearing lest Paul should have been pulled in pieces of them. He commanded the soldiers to go down to take him by force from the people, from the Jews, and bring him back into the castle. I mean, what an ordeal. Can you imagine having to go through all of this and, and in the night, 
It says the night following that the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul. For as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. Now, before the prophet said, you're going to be bound. This is what's going to happen to you in Jerusalem. And, and maybe Paul is thinking, this is it. I am going to die. I'm going to be, I'm, I'm going to die here. I'm never going to leave Jerusalem. And the Lord said, no, I have greater purpose for you. You will go to Rome and testify of me. Paul knew that God was with him and that that was going to be carried out. When it was day, certain of the Jews banded together, bound themselves with a curse saying, we're going to kill Paul. They made a conspiracy that when he comes out and they do this and they gather them all together, we're going to kill him. And we won't eat or drink until we kill the apostle Paul. They made that agreement. But somebody overheard. And it was the nephew, so... We see uh, Paul's sister's son, verse 16. Paul's nephew heard this, came in, told Paul. Paul said, look, you need to go tell the chief captain. And so his nephew goes and he tells the chief captain, there's a conspiracy. When you bring Paul out, they're going to kill him. And so when the chief captain heard this, he made ready, according to verse 23, 200 soldiers to go to Caesarea. That's, again, on the coast, maritime. And horsemen, three score and ten, 70 horsemen, 200 spearmen in the middle of the night, starting at 9 p.m., and they were going to ride through the night to take the Apostle Paul out of the city of Jerusalem. Look, let me tell you, when the Lord says a thing will be done, it will be done. Now, you're sitting there thinking, how in the world is, is that man ever going to leave? That There were people watching for Paul, and yet Paul left with an entire Roman group or army, as we would say, guarding him to make sure that there was no way that they could get at him. The Lord provided this, and so he's taken over, and this is where we are introduced to Felix. All of this has happened to the Apostle Paul, and finally we find that there were letters that were written up, and in verse 24 it even says that there were beasts that were going along with all of these soldiers to bring... Paul safely to the governor. So this, this captain, he's a, he's a lower man on the totem pole. He is a military man, and he is one that has charge over a good number of soldiers, and yet he knows there's somebody higher that has to hear this case anyways. No matter what we do or say here, this has got to go up to another higher court, and so I'm going to send him to the governor of the entire region. And so they did. And so now he's going to the governor. His name is Felix. And so he wrote a letter. And this, this, this chief captain, his name is Claudius Lysias. That is in verse 26. And he wrote this letter to the governor, Felix, and explained everything and explained what had happened. We read in verse 31, they only made it about halfway. They made it to a city that is in between Jerusalem and Caesarea Maritime. They made it to end. Ty Patris. And that is a city that's a long way according to verse 31. And then the next day they, they let the horsemen go with them and then they return to the castle. So part of the guard returned back to the castle and then Paul goes on and he makes it to Caesarea. And when he gets to Caesarea, he gets to meet Felix, the governor. He gets the letter, he reads it and he, and he asks the apostle Paul, now where are you from? And he says, well, I'm from Sicily. And he says, okay, well, I, I'm going to hear you when your accusers are come. And so he commanded that the Apostle Paul be kept in the Praetorian. That is the area where the Praetorian guard would also stay, but it was a judgment hall of Herod. And so he's there. He's in the governor's residence. They had a compound for the governor, and that's where he's staying. And he's waiting for the trial to take place. In verse 24, five days it took for his accusers to come. Five days. And then here comes the high priest, Ananias. He descends with the elders, and he didn't come alone. He came prepared, and he brought an attorney. He brought a lawyer. He brought an orator to represent the Jews' case against the Apostle Paul. And so Tertullus is this gentleman's name. And so he stands up, and he begins to address Felix, and he's no dummy. 
And so he strokes Felix's uh, ego and tells him how good Felix has done and how good things are under Governor Felix's rule, which is just a bunch of baloney. Because we read in history, things were terrible. That when Felix was governor, he was a bad governor. He was an immoral person. And so this, <laughs> this uh, representative, this advocate, he's going to stroke the feathers of, uh, of uh, the uh, Felix, the governor, so that he gets a good standing. And he says to Felix, now, th this guy, this incompetent individual, this captain, uh, Claudius Lysias, he, this gentleman, he's incompetent. He should have never sent you the Apostle Paul because we had this thing taken care of over here in Jerusalem. And it should have never left our jurisdiction in Jerusalem. It should have, should have stayed there. But he decided to do this thing all on his own. Now that's a massive paraphrase of the verses that follow in Acts chapter 24. But that's exactly what he said. He said, this guy, he's a pest. Verse 5 of Acts chapter 24. He's an individual that's caused a lot of division among the Jews. He's a ringleader of those Nazarenes. Ultimately, he's talking about the Christians. And he profaned the temple, but we took him and we were going to judge him. But this other guy, he was incompetent, verse 7. And so that he came and did something foolish. He took Paul away and did all of this. He should have never done that. And now it's Paul's turn, verse 10. Now Paul has an opportunity to stand before and to be able to give an account of everything that has taken place. And Paul says, look, I didn't do this. When they came and they saw me, I went to Jerusalem to worship. And when they found me, verse 12, in the temple, they didn't find me disputing with any man. They didn't find me in a tumult, raising up a big division or raising the people up. They didn't find me in the synagogue. They didn't find me the way that they said. All of this is fabrication and lies. So Paul has an opportunity to stand before those that are of law and to give an answer for what has taken place. In verse, 30, uh, verse 13, he says they have no proof. So you can imagine the other gentleman has a, an, an advocate, an attorney, an orator who stands before and speaks to Felix. And now Paul, he's speaking on his own. And he says, there's no proof. There's no evidence. They have nothing. But he says, this will I confess. I will confess. I worship God. Now what they said of me and the fact that I, I follow the way, verse 14, and I worship the God of my fathers. You know what? That's true. I confess to that. That is true. He says, another thing that's true in verse 15, I have hope of the resurrection and I believe it. That is a valid accusation. But you know that there was really nothing for them to truly uh, convict the Apostle Paul on because they had just fabricated all of these things just to kill him. They did not want him preaching Christ and him crucified. They didn't want him preaching the resurrected Messiah, Jesus the Christ. They didn't want that message. And so the Jews wanted him killed. They wanted to stop the gospel. So as he's there, in verse 17, he explains everything that he had done and how he had come to Jerusalem to bring alms, that's money and offerings, in verse 17. But the Jews of Asia found him and they created a big problem. And he says in verse 19, the people who started this this uh, big uh, mess, you would say, who started all of this, they're not even here. The people who accuse me in Jerusalem are not even present. And so, again, there isn't the first-hand witness. This is the fourth-hand, third, you know, third-hand witnesses that are there. They're not those that actually made the accusation from Asia. And so he said they ought to be here um, if they really had any ought against me, verse 19, or else let these same here say so. And so all of this continues on and he basically says the reason I'm here is because of the resurrection of the dead. In verse 21, that's why they brought me here. In verse 22, when Felix heard these things. Now it's going to give us a little, little bit of background on Felix. I want to pause here for just a moment. I'm going to put my finger on verse 22. We're going to come back. I want to show you a couple of things by way of background. We're going to come back to our text as we understand what is Felix going to do and how are these things going to impact his decision. This here is uh, Felix, 
And Tacitus, the historian, who was not a Christian, um, he wasn't religious, he said this about Felix. He said he practiced every kind of cruelty and lust, wielding the power of a king with all the instincts of a slave. So if you want to know any background about Felix and who we're going to be discussing in the text, look, he was real. You have to understand, when we're reading through the text of the Bible, especially call it the book of Acts, the history of the Acts of the Apostles, right? It's history. This really happened. It's not a fairy tale. It's not some story that's made up. What you're reading is history. And just as we can go back and we can read through the annals of Tacitus and his histories, it shows us what took place. And this correlates perfectly with the Roman records of the rulers that they mention in the text. Felix and Festus and Agrippa, all of those individuals that are mentioned in the text here, they are record, on record as being historic and genuine. So Felix was, was a wicked individual. I mean, even from a, a Roman who generally would not run down another Roman, you've got a Roman, Tacitus, who says this guy was a very good guy. He was pretty wicked. Uh, and... Uh, this just by way of saying this is another piece of evidence that truly he was a legitimate ruler and this is a coin that was minted in 56, 57. Now we're going to find that the Apostle Paul has now entered into the jurisdiction and custody of Felix. The Apostle Paul will be there for two years under the custody of Felix from 58 AD to 60 AD during the rule of Felix. Now here... I wanted to show you an image of what this area is like. And we're talking about Caesarea Maritime. Here are the ruins of the place in which the Apostle Paul has been brought. And again, here's another picture as well of the arena that they had there. Tacitus records that terrible cruelties were practiced on the Jews under Felix and Florus. Titus here celebrated the birthday of his brother Domitian. When he did so, he set 2,500 Jews to fight with beasts in the amphitheater. And so this gives you a little bit of a background of the cruelty and the difficulties under the Roman Empire, the relationship between the Jews and the Romans further on down the road as you continue around 90 AD with Domitian and his rule. This gives you a picture of what it's like there now looking down upon Caesarea Maritime. So when we say it's on the water, it's on the water. And uh, you can see a lot of the ruins that are there, and you can see where they have parts where they were having their games and activities and the amphitheater and uh, all of that that is there. And so I want to go back to our text. We realize the background of Felix in verse 22. And when, when Felix heard these things, having more perfect knowledge of that way or the way, he deferred them and said, when Lysias, that's the guy that was there, that was the captain who arrested the Apostle Paul in Jerusalem and sent him to Caesarea. He says, when Lysias, the chief captain, shall come down, I will know the uttermost of the matter. And so... Felix was really good at tabling something. We would kind of say he punted the ball. He's got the ball, the ball's in his court, and he says, I'm uncomfortable holding this. I'm kicking the ball. Somebody else take it. Now, who else is notorious for this in the Bible account with Jesus? It's Pontius Pilate. He washed his hands in the bowl. My hands are clean of this. He punted the ball. At least he tried to. He tried to say, this, this is not on me. Somebody else needs to take the responsibility. And here you have Felix. He, and, and notice it says that Felix had a, a pretty good knowledge of the way of Christianity. I find that interesting that he has already come in contact with those that are Christians. He already has a pretty good understanding of their beliefs and their practices. And now we continue to read. He says, look, I'm going to wait until... Then Lysias comes down here to settle this, and so we're just going to wait. And so he commanded a, a centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty that he should forbid none of his acquaintances to minister or to come to him. And after certain days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, which was a Jewess, he sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. So now, a little bit of background. Drusilla, that's, uh, that's Felix's second wife. He had a first wife, and now he has taken the second. Drusilla was married to another man, 
another king. And Felix was, we'd say a rounder. I don't know. He was, he was an individual that, that was uh, involved in lustful activities. And he was an individual who decided that he wanted that woman. And so he actually seduced her and took her so that she divorced her first husband and then came to him. And so he stole basically Drusilla from uh, her husband and then took her as a wife. And so that gives you a little bit of background on Felix in this context. And so now Drusilla is there with Felix and they want to listen. They come, they sit down, we say, we want to hear what you've got to say about your faith. Tell us about it. Give us some more information. And so we find in verse 25, as he reasoned of righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come, Felix responded. Now, I can just imagine the topic that was addressed here as he reasons of righteousness, temperance, and judgment. All of those things are significant and how they would impact Felix. And Felix had a, an emotional response, a mental response to the words that he heard. He was alerted. He was alarmed. He trembled. He was afraid at what he heard. Look, he knew the application that, that had to be made to him and what Christianity meant to him and where he stood before God. He knew, but then what does the Bible say? He said, go away. Direct command. Imperative. Go away. At this time, when I have a convenient season, I will call for thee. At that point in time, after hearing all about the faith, and it was extensive for him to reason of righteousness, temperance, and judgment, that took some time. So after hearing all of these things, he says, go away right now. I can't handle it. I don't want to hear anymore. He was shook up. But the Bible says that he continued to call. So even though he tabled it, he did bring back, uh, the Bible says, uh, oftener in the King James, more often. But you know why? In verse 26 it says because he wanted a bride. He wanted some money. And so he would call for him hoping that, that maybe Paul would pay him so that he could be loosed and that he could go. And so he sent for him. He communed with him. This took place over a long period of time. We come to verse 27. Two years. Two years later. Paul's there for two years. Hell. And the Bible says that now Festus comes along. Of course he has Festus. And uh, he takes the gentleman's place. He takes Felix's place. And no longer is Felix the governor. Now Festus is the governor. And so um, Felix, instead of doing what is right and releasing the apostle Paul and refuses to do so, instead Felix decides that he's going to try to please his constituency and he's going to leave Paul in prison. He doesn't want to upset the Jews. And so he does. Now we stop at this point. We ask three basic, three basic questions. The lesson will be yours. Three questions. Three basic points. Why, Felix? Why did you do this? All this led up. The Apostle Paul, we see what he's gone through. He finally comes to Felix and he, he pours out his heart to Felix. He preaches the gospel to Felix. He tells him all about the faith. And Felix has already got a background. Why, Felix, did you not obey Two years, aside from the fact that he already knew quite a bit about the way and still would not obey, had an emotional response to the gospel of Christ, was alarmed and alerted and afraid about the judgment to come and still did not obey. Why did he hear the gospel over and over and refuse to obey? I'll give you three reasons. First one, political reasons. He was worried at what people would think. What will people think of me? And I want you to think about this. We're looking at Felix, but we're going to make application to ourselves because if there are those that are here today, I want you to think about this in correlation with your life. If you've not obeyed the gospel, if you've not been baptized into Christ so that your sins can be washed away, I want you to think about this long and hard. Felix had the opportunity and he squandered it. Why? Felix? He was afraid what people would think of him. He put it off. He knew that Paul was right. He knew that Paul needed to be released. He knew that Paul was innocent. But to say that Paul was innocent was to rule against the Jews. And so he wanted the Jews to be happy. And he worried what his political constituents thought. And he worried about what people thought instead of what was right. Oh, that'll preach a whole separate sermon today in the political arena, won't it? Caring more about... What people think than what 
is right. For Felix, he says, I'm not going to do the right thing because people might say the wrong thing about me and so I'm not going to do it. Some people refuse to obey the gospel. They are, they're afraid. Well, you know, what will people think? I mean, what will people say? And, and how will this affect me? Don't make choices of right or wrong based upon what people think of you or on the opinions of others. Don't make choices of right or wrong based upon that. We know we base our choices of right or wrong based upon the highest power there is, and that's upon God. Some may say, well, what will my parents say? Or what will my friends say? Often we bow to the pressure that is put on us by others and we're worried about what they might think instead of what we know is right. Felix was more concerned about what people thought than about what God thought. Number two, financial reasons. What will this cost me? What will it cost me if I obey the gospel of Jesus Christ for Felix? He observed that the Apostle Paul, he was a man of means. In verse 17, he had alms and offerings. That's why he came to Jerusalem. He knew that he had, in verse 23, friends that would come and that would prepare and take care of his needs. So he had connections and people with means. He hoped that money would be given to him, verse 26, so that he could be freed. And so he believed that, that there was money that could be involved in the situation. And so he wanted a bribe. That's a conflict of interest. Felix, if he listened to the Apostle Paul and obeyed the gospel, he probably knew that he wasn't going to get any money. He probably knew that he wasn't going to get that bribe if, if now he's a Christian and that he would have to do something completely different. He would have to let the Apostle Paul go because then he was a Christian. He would have to do the right thing. For him, though, especially obeying the gospel had financial repercussions. Today, the same is with people today. And that may be the reason why they haven't obeyed the gospel, why they haven't given their life to Christ. And they may think, well, you know, what? maybe I have to lose my job because my profession is not that which God would approve of. Will I have to share my money with others? Am I going to have to make my decisions about how I actually make my money and do it in a right way instead of a dishonest way? Will I have to make different choices about my entertainment or rearrange my life? Will I have to change what I do with my retirement? I'm sure Felix thought if I obey the gospel, I'm not going to get what I really want. And you know what I really want is that bribe that this man is going to give me in Acts chapter 19 verses 18 through 20 in Ephesus. We find those that believed and confessed and showed their deeds and they brought those books with them. They burned them. The Bible says the price was found at 50,000 pieces of silver. That means that they took their possessions that they paid good money for. They knew that they were wicked and evil and they burnt them. They destroyed them so that they could follow the Christ. There were financial repercussions for them in obeying the gospel of Christ. And you know what? They were willing to pay it. Willing to pay the price. You look at the rich young ruler, he walked away sorrowfully because he was not willing to pay the price. Zacchaeus in Acts chapter, I mean, excuse me, in Luke chapter 19, verses 2 through 8. You've got Zacchaeus in verse 8. Zacchaeus stood, he said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. Was there financial repercussions in, in Zacchaeus becoming a New Testament Christian obeying the gospel? You better believe it. But he paid the price and was happily willing to do so to follow Christ. We've got to trust in God and not in ourselves. And you know, some decisions are so important that we've got to be motivated to follow them no matter the cost. Number three, personal reasons as to why he wouldn't obey the gospel. What am I going to have to change? If I mean, if I obey the gospel, what am I going to have to change? You look at here in this text in Acts chapter 24, verses 24 and 25, we see Felix. He's got Drusilla there with him. He stole another man's wife. There's going to have to be a price that's paid. And yet when you find that Paul was preaching, he preached of righteousness. What does that mean for Felix? Felix. 
What did that mean for him? What does that say about how Felix was ruling his people? He was awful to the people that he ruled. Now it doesn't matter just what the people think of Felix. It matters what God thinks. He was going to have to change everything about how he was living and how he was ruling and what he was doing in his job. Everything was going to have to change. Paul preached to him about self-control. Felix lacked that self-control. He stole another man's wife. There are just certain things that are off limits and he refused to put that boundary there. And that meant he was going to have to change his life in repentance. We're going to get to have Drusilla anymore. He taught of the coming judgment. And you know what? That means that we got to answer for our deeds. And I'm sure Felix realized when he heard this, and he, the Bible says he trembled. He was alarmed. Why? Because he realized he was not living in the way that would please God. And judgment was coming for him. Every single one of us is going to have to stand before the judgment seat of God and give an account of the things we've done in our life, whether they are good or whether they are evil. And the question today is, are you ready for that day? Are you ready? Felix was not ready. That's why he trembled. Felix would rather opt out and refuse responsibility to try to pass it off to someone else. One reason I'm sure that he went through his mind, what am I going to have to change? What's it going to take for you this morning to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ? Are you going to have to wait until you're on your deathbed to give your life to Christ? Are you going to have to wait till you have the hospice diagnosis before you give your life to Christ? What are you waiting for? Obey the gospel today. Believe that Jesus is the Savior of the world. Believe that He bled and died for you on the cross so that you could have eternal life. Won't you believe it today? Today, won't you confess before this audience with your lips, Romans chapter 10 and verse 10, unto salvation that Jesus Christ is the resurrected Messiah, the Savior of the world. Won't you do it today? Won't you today repent and turn away from your sin? Do what Zacchaeus did. Look at your life and say, I'm not going to live that way anymore. I'm going to repent. I'm going to turn away from those sins. I'm going to show by my deeds that I've changed my life. you got to change in repentance. Acts chapter 17 and verse 30. And today, be willing to be baptized. What in the world would lead someone like the Apostle Paul to go through what he went through and not just to say, look, I don't care about this Christ. I don't care about the resurrection. I give up. You win. Leave me alone. I'm walking away from this. Why didn't he do it? Brethren, he believed it. And in Acts 22, when he stood before them and he gave an account of his salvation, he said that he was waiting. And an ice came in and said, why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. There was something that he needed to do that he had not done. And his sins were not washed away. Though he was there and he was praying earnestly, according to Acts chapter 9 and verse 11, he was praying but he was lost because his sins were still with him. He had not been baptized, washing away his sins, calling on the name of the Lord. The question is, what will you do? Don't be a phoenix. Why? Why, Felix? Why did you do it? Why did you turn away from the Christ? Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3 says, How shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? Today, don't, don't neglect it. Today, overcome the hurdles that Felix just couldn't seem to get past. Overcome those hurdles. And say, today, I put the Lord first you have a need, won't you come? We have an invitation song that has been prepared. Will you come? Together we stand and as we sing.